So today I'm going to do quite a long special talking about direct recording. This is to celebrate the relaunch of a few products that I've been making for a while, which I've redesigned so that I can make them faster, a little bit cheaper and more reliably. Um, suit the current times, eh? So in our product range at the moment, for recording attenuated amounts, we've got five basic items. We've got the classic Hotbox 120. So this is a resistive power attenuator. It's a straightforward, very well made, high power device capable of handling a full 120 watts of overload. Although it can get pretty hot with some high end marshals, but that's just what they do. Um, it has a bright, clear kind of quality. And normally the only thing we think of with attenuators is we think we're going to make our 100 watt Marshall sound like a 5 watt Marshall so we can use it in our bedroom. Of course it does that, but it can also be used for recordings I'll show soon. The second item in our lineup is the flagship, the Hotbox 130. This has been an ongoing evolution over several years and we are done now. I'm very happy with this. I've had a lot of problems again with price hikes on parts. The two rotary switches alone in this set me back around 20 odd pounds just for those in parts, just the two switches. Okay, so the price is relatively high, but for what's inside it, it's an absolute bargain. And we've got reliability really up to a load of really great things. And of course, this is a reactive and resistive unit with the four modes, which I've talked about in other videos, which can be simply thought of as a resistive, bright, open sound, and then gradually increasing amounts of mid-range and warmth uh, responsiveness. Again, predominantly used for reducing your loud amplifiers to quiet, but we can use this for recording as we're gonna to come to. The third item is something I haven't sold very many of because I've never really pushed it to the forefront because I've not been ready to push it to the forefront. And this is our reactive load which I mistyped as reactive loaf in the early days. And I think that's kind of stuck. So the next batch of stickers, I'm probably going to call it the reactive loaf. It does look a little like a loaf of bread. So this is a dummy load. It doesn't provide the recording facilities by itself. But again, same as the other two, we've got an add on for it. It allows silent use of your amplifier. It's reactive 100%. There are no resistive modes on this. But we've got four modes and this one's very advanced in so much as you can choose between two inductance levels. So it's like choosing between two amounts of uh, coils of wire on your speaker and two damping levels, which is like choosing between two different weights of speaker. So this gives you a total of four possible reactive sounds to again, to fine tune um, how everything sounds. These have a, again, a custom wound coil inside them. Mainly we sell these in eight ohms because when using a dummy load, there are no speakers. We don't care about the speakers. And so it's more cost effective for us to manufacture one own. We can make this in fours and sixteens and even twos as well, but generally eights are what we'll mainly be making. So this, I simply put, you plug it on, silence, and you rely generally on something else to provide the recording. So we've got our attenuator, resistive, right? Attenuator, reactive, four different tones, different things and our reactive load, which is total silence, which is really a relaunch. We've had them for a while, I say, push them forefront. This couples with the fourth item in the range, and this is what I'm really pleased about. I'm relaunching the direct recording box. At one point I called this the hotline, but um, it was a bit of a gimmicky name. I, think I prefer names that say what a thing does. You know, um, as a rule, a little bit of play is good, but I was like, direct recording box is what this is. Now this is designed to use, work with any three of these items and give you a line out. I haven't put a line out in these for the simple reason I want you to be able to upgrade your item. I don't want you to buy an attenuator or a load box and be stuck with that one line out and that's all you've got forevermore. I want you to be able to buy different things and this is a more advanced line out. We have a tone control which allows you to filter out the harshness and brightness which is the most important aspect of direct recording, as I'll talk about in a minute. We have a switch that goes between zero load and load box. And what that does is in, well, zero load, so in hot box. In hot box mode, this acts like a five watt, 15 ohm 
um, dummy load. So that can work on the output of either of the two attenuators in hotbox mode, the hotbox 120 is, and they see it as a tiny little five watt speaker, which is perfect for turning those down and letting everything interact exactly as you want. You can also use it with um, amplifiers of five watt or under on its own in hotbox mode. These are only available in 15 ohm. Now there's a reason for this is ohm matching is mainly about power transfer. When it comes to voltage transfer, which is for signals and for audio, we couldn't care less about the power. We just want to make sure everything's safe. The power is just sort of a, we, we need to be able to handle it, but we're not going to use it. So 15 ohm ensures that this works perfectly with two, four, eight and 16 ohm attenuators. It doesn't matter that it's mismatched because we're not doing power transfers. We're not driving a speaker. We're only interested in having something to suck up the power and then tap off a little bit of voltage, which we're going to send to our recording system. So that little bit of voltage can be filtered with a tone control. It can also um, theoretically clip. So if the voltage goes too high, we don't want this to accidentally send too many volts to your protect to your uh, expensive recording gear. So if your amplifier peaks and you've got something wrong, we don't want to send more than one to two volts to that sensitive gear. It's often running off USB, which is five volts. And there's a thing that happens with electronic equipment. If the input goes higher than the power supply, boom, chips die. We can't have it. So this limits the output to around two volts, no matter what you put in. So if you have your stack at full one, it's about hundreds of volts and you set the settings wrong, doesn't matter. This will light up orange and say protected and protect your recording gear. So that's very important. And again, if I put a line out in these, would they have that? Who knows? Probably not. A lot of line outs not going to have protection. So you've got the tone filtering, you've got the protection circuitry. We've also got a ground lift. Now, the thing about noisy ground, which will come across your pedals and you get ground loops, you're always going after your isolated fast splice. It's very, very, very simple this actually. If you twist a piece of wire into a circle and take a tap off it, you get an AM radio antenna that picks up all AM noise, all the electrical noise in the world, and that's what you're picking up. So with your pedals, you'll have an, you'll have an earth that goes from audio in to audio out on two pedals, and then you have an earth that goes from power supply to power supply. So you've created that loop. And when you use an isolated power supply, you're breaking that loop so that you've effectively got two power supplies that are totally separate and the link goes for the audio cable. Interesting fact, you can skip the isolated power supply completely, uh, get a non-isolated one and just make up a set of patch leaves that have an earth disconnected at one end, does the same thing. So earth lift on this is quite similar. If your recording device has an earth and your amp has an earth, we're going to create an earth loop because you're going to get the audio path going to have an earth and then it's going to go back through the mains and you get a loop and have noise. So a lot of USB does not have an earth. USB very often doesn't have an earth. So a lot of recording won't have it. So normally we'll put this on normal and start on normal. And if there's some horrible noise, try flicking it to lift and it might just go away. So we've got the earth lift. We've got the tone control, we've got the protective clipping on the output, protective limiter. Doesn't get in the way if you're not hitting limit. And that's mainly in hotbox load with the five watt load. Zero load mode's a little different. So in zero load mode, this has no load whatsoever. And you can connect this to any speaker out on any amplifier and it will not see this unit. It will just be invisible. So this works really well with something like a load box. So this is already providing 100% of the load you need. Or if you're not using any attenuator and you're just using speakers, we can put this in zero load, connect this, daisy chained after this, and this will then again do all the things I've talked about, the limiting, the filtering, and again provide you a safe output signal. And the nice thing about zero load is where hotbox is really limited to five watts of load, so you have to use it after an attenuator. Zero load, you can put 300 watts into this. Yeah, really, because it's not, handling power, it's just going to look at that signal and take an immeasurably small amount of it and send it to uh, your recording gear. So it, it, it can handle a huge amount of power in that regard. Okay, so that's the four main items. There's a fifth. We don't, I used to sell it's speaker cables. It's as simple as that. 
it's very important to have good quality speaker cables, not for the pompous reasons people who say, oh, you have to have so much copper and so much this, and you can hear this huge difference. You're not going to hear a huge difference unless you've got really lousy speaker cables to begin with, but unfortunately a lot of us do. One thing you should never, ever use with a tube amp output is a patch lead or a screened lead. And that's because we have this capacitance because you have a screen around, a capacitor is any two metal plates that are, that are close and covering. So a centre core with a screen creates a capacitance. This interacts with the transformer amp, ruins the tone. Absolutely. In addition, screen tails tend to be very, 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 very thin. So you can lose power at best and at worst, you could just burn the cable out. Never use them. So a good quality speaker cable is... Brilliant investment, in my opinion. You, especially some of you, I mean, this is only a couple of hundred quid amp. Who cares about a couple of hundred quid amp? You know, you're using thousand pound amp, two thousand pound amp. What about your speakers? What about your gear? What's it worth, really, when you skimp on a speaker cable and spend, I go, oh, I don't want to spend five pound on a cable, I want to spend ten pound, I want to spend this. You're plugging a thousand quid Marshall, two thousand quid vintage amp, measure or something and you grumble about 10 quid. So we make these, but sadly I don't sell them separate anymore for the simple reason it's too time consuming. I mainly do these. You can buy cost-effective speaker cables off eBay, Amazon, whatever. Just, just buy someone else, it's fine. This is because I need speaker cables and I like premium cables and occasionally I like making them and it's fun. So our, our stack pack, as I call it, I think this is very cool. These are coming in at 50 to 60 quid, depending where you buy them. They are cool little bag with our sprayed on logo. I put a lot of effort into these in uh, and they're very premium. They have straight jacks at one end and right angle at the other. They're Rian jacks. These are specifically for speaker power levels, all of the, and these two. So they're a little bit larger than normal to handle the higher current. You get a half meter, a one meter and a one and a half meter. And the reason for that is the half meter, it's, it's, it's what I call it a stack pack. The half meter designed to go from your head to your attenuator and the one meter and the one and a half are just right to go to your two large cabs, a stack pack. So that's our fifth item. Mainly, make sure you've got a good cable. So I'm gonna show you how you plug some of this in now. It's quite a talky video, I know. So we're gonna go for our big pile of cables, I'll pick out the ones we want. There's a little half meter. And again, I like this idea of having a right angle at one end and straight at the other, because there are times on amps when you kind of like, oh, that's not going to go in at a right angle, that's a good for a straight, and there's other locations like we go around the back of this and we'll unplug the power. As well. You know, we'll, I'll sort of look at this and say, well, actually, I'd rather have a, a right angle here because I'm going to plug it in this one and I can have it nice and flat and push it up against something. So I'm going to plug my right angle in. There. Right angle from the speaker output. Now, I've chosen the 16 ohm output in this case, and I'm going to plug it into the red input on this. It's red to red, it says amp in. So you connect your amp in from the amp speaker out to the amp in on this, on the red. Some amps have a red jack on the back. If they have a red jack on the output, it's generally red to red, simple as that. From our speaker out, we'll select another cable. Now we're a very low power after the attenuator. So this is an occasion when you can get away with a patch lead if you want. I will take either of our speaker outs, doesn't matter on this and plug it into the input on this and then from there we will find ourselves an audio lead and go from the output on this to our recording device. So we've got quite a daisy chain going on but this is quite effective. Amp into attenuator red to red, amp out to amp in, speaker out from attenuator into the direct recording box which will set on hot box mode We'll start with normal on ground, hotbox mode, turn the level down, but I'll keep the tone up to start with, and this out to your recording gear. Exactly the same if you're using the big hotbox. Same colours, red to red, speaker out to speaker out. Hotbox mode. And you can just get straight into that and record. Turn everything up. If you don't think there's a signal coming through at first, it's probably just a bit quiet. Um, you may not have realised how much you've attenuated because obviously you've got no speakers to hear. You can also, in this case, do something rather, rather cool. 
if you want to plug a speaker into this at the same time as recording, we can absolutely do that. We'll use the other output and plug that into a speaker. I've got one at the back here. I'm not going to plug it in because it's a bit clean, but I'll pretend I plugged it in for a minute. And now put the hotbox into zero load mode. So now the attenuator can't see this anymore. So even if it's plugged in, it can't see it. And that's uh, output the attenuator will go to the speaker. So as far as the amp's concerned, it's head, attenuator, speaker. But this is secretly piggybacking in zero load mode. And now you can record that way. You could also leave it in hotbox mode if you wanted. And then this would be effectively seeing two speakers. Since this 15 ohm, if you had you can work it out the ohms. Alternatively, we can use the uh, reactive loaf. Now this one is an amp in slash through. So the moment we connect this, we're done. That's fine. That amp can work, but because we've got no way to record. Now, if you have a line out on your head, you can just immediately record from that. Now take it out and not worry about the speakers. If you don't have a line out, you want something more advanced with more control, We've got the direct recording box. And again, zero load mode, because we don't want to add an extra load. We've got 100% load. So you want this to be a, a, secret, a secret piggybacking. We'll plug that in. Now this can't see this, this can't see this, but it'll sense the voltage, it'll read the voltage. And now again, in zero load, we'll pass it on. If you're using this with a dummy load and you accidentally put it on hot box, you are going to split the load 50-50 between these, and this only has a five watt capacity. So um, that's, that's probably going to be at risk of burning out, but you'll see it immediately. The orange light will just come on and be like, oh, and hopefully you'll have the time to turn that off. You know, because I, unfortunately, this is one of the other, the nature of a lot of this equipment. We're dealing with very high power levels. I can't protect against every eventuality you guys can dream up. I just can't. And I do my best and I put sensible circuits in or do, I've started adding to the latest version of these, I've started adding a self-resetting automatic fuse on the volume control because the most common damage is done to this volume control where people connect it backwards and put the full hundreds of power through the very delicate five watt control and it just burns out. You know, it's why the red ring is there. It's why I've added, I'm now adding this, uh, this fuse, this self-resetting fuse. And unfortunately, those those long controls are also shot at a price. There were a couple of quid ago where I started and they're near, I mean, I have to import them, they're like nearly a tenner a piece already. And now that we're assembling these on a combined board with the switches, which speeds of production, makes reliability higher, that front panel assembly is probably worth 35, 40 pounds before I even consider profit. So, you know, damaging that becomes more of a problem for everyone. So again, hopefully this self-resetting fuse will protect against that occasional accidental damage. It can stand a few seconds, but um, you know, it's just the nature. You can't protect against everything. You need a bit of sensibleness. So, okay, so I hope that's been informative and I will set up some audio demos, but I thought for now we'd talk it through and, uh, show you guys the ecosystem. I'm really proud of this ecosystem. And towards the end of this year, well, towards the middle of this year, I'm gonna start working on some plugins of our own that will be given away free. Because at the moment, I direct you guys to other plugins. And towards the end of the year, I will be looking at making a fully fledged, um, pure analog, inductive based, transformer based recording tool. That it's like nothing anyone's got. And I'm really, I've been after doing that for a couple of years, but, uh, you know what the world's like, financial knockbacks. You know, I've done my best, but it's just me and my helpers and um, just keeping afloat has taken everything I've got. You know, adding products and growing has not, it's been a very slow process for the last few years, um, I think understandably. Okay, so uh, well, before I wrap up, I'll throw one more thing in. I wanna talk a little bit actually, because I mentioned plugins and I nearly forgot the plugins thing. So even though we've got this filter tip higher harshness out, and I, I like a passive um, analog filter because it has less phase issues and it has less 
other issues. Doing it outsourced to me is something I quite like. You know you're going to roll a bit off, so take a bit off now. Different philosophy, that's mine. So there are a variety of different plugins out there. Impulse Response is the favourite. Most people use Impulse Response cabs. And those are like a photocopy, facsimile, snapshot of a speaker cab. They're very accurate. And I've linked to a couple of them on the website. And you can get those and run them after this. I think it sounds all right without um, cab sims, but a cab sim is going to thicken your sound up, make it sweeter and warmer. I think there's also some plugins out there that are not IR based. So impulse responses, the thing with the impulse response, as I'm closing, is that they can't really be tweaked or tuned. They're like a photograph. You take a photograph, you're done. Um, or you used to be, these days you can edit everything. And it's a bit like that with impulse response. So to say they're not easy to edit, you get what you get. Whereas a non-impulse response based one, a true plugin with controls that let you fine tune things, allows you to be creative, but may not be as directly accurate. So those are just sort of your two trade-offs when you're looking at plugins. Either photo perfection realism without any tweakability or with minimal tweakability or a lot of tweakability without photo realistic perfection. And I quite like the latter. as And when we do go around to doing our own plugins for this, uh, it's, it's another enterprise, you know, so I'm, I've done plugins before for fun, but I've never done one to let other people have. Um, then I'll be doing it that latter way. I'll be steering away from impulse response because I think there's a thousand of them already. You can just grab one for free. Yeah, it's not it's not difficult. Um, and I will, in that theme, if I can find some free collections of really good cab sims, I might add those to the website. And if you know of any, feel free to point me in the direction. But they have to be legitimately free, you know, because we're a book or business and all that. You know. What you do in the privacy of your own bedroom is up to you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. As I said, quite a long one. Hopefully you've enjoyed that. And... I shall see you again with some audio demos at some point soon. Enjoy your weekend.